okay, so here's a different experience from mine. It, it's not good. It's not bad. It's just different from mine and that it's okay. That is different. So I don't think that shying away from it will help. You're listening to the Mindful Mama podcast, episode 190. Today, we're talking about motherhood so white with Nefertiti Austin. Welcome to the Mindful Mama podcast. Here, it's about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent. At Mindful Mama, we know that you cannot give what you do not have. And when you have calm and peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm your host, Hunter Clark Fields, Mindful Mama Mentor. I help smart, thoughtful parents stay calm so they can have strong, connected relationships with their children. I've been practicing mindfulness for over 20 years. I'm the creator of the Mindful Parenting Membership, and I'm the author of the upcoming new book, Raising Good Humans. Welcome back to the podcast. I am so glad you are here today because... In just a moment, I am going to be sitting down with Nefertiti Austin, who is an author and the single mother of two children she adopted out of the foster care system. And she has written an amazing memoir, Motherhood So White, and it's already out. And it's really fascinating because, you know, we we stay in our little bubbles of our own little worlds. And I think it's so important for us to be to broaden our awareness and consciousness of all different kinds of worlds. And, you know, when you're a single black adoptive mother, you look around this culture and you find very little representation. And so it it is so much, you know, this is so much so that like, if you're that person, your story really becomes invisible to like, to the white majority, right? Which is me, like I'm in that white majority. So we need these stories. We need to open up our ears to different experiences that not every family looks like Donna Reed, but many white moms may not realize the ways that we can support um, black moms or people of color, or we can make it harder. So this is this is a powerful episode for you to listen to and be part of and share around because we need to have these conversations. We need to have these all kinds of conversations about these things. And we're going to talk a lot of, we're going to, I want you to listen for some takeaways. You're going to hear about these four vital things every mom, but especially solo moms need so that you're not becoming overwhelmed by life, right? All our different responsibilities. Hear about the, how black moms have this added burden of teaching. They have to teach a lot of different things to their children, to others, and things like that. And you're also going to hear about white parents can do to ease the burden on black parents. And so this is really powerful for for me, and I know it's going to be incredibly powerful for you. And before we dive in, I want to let you know that we are having some exciting events to launch Raising Good Humans. The pre-sale is open. You can buy it now. You can check it out at RaisingGoodHumans.com. Book. Sorry, RaisingGoodHumansBook.com. Put that book in there or you aren't going to get there. We are going to be having, I'm going to be having um, a live event, Raising Good Humans Live, with so many amazing teachers, including Dr. Laura Markham from AHA Parenting, including my friend Oren Sofer, who wrote, oh, I'm blanking on the name of his book. It's Say What You Mean, which was so, so good. And we're going to be having Hal Runkle of The Scream Free Parent, my fr- good friend Carla Nomberg. So make sure you check out this our Raising Good Humans Live event, which is to kind of launch our pre-sale campaign. That's going to be coming up soon. You can definitely find a link to it on RaisingGoodHumansBook.com. And I will put up something on my resources page on my website. So, or if you're on the newsletter, we will send you an invitation to join. It's going to be really exciting. We'll be getting going live every day in the Facebook group. Some of the things we're going to be talking about are how to get little kids to listen with Julie King and Joanne Farber, how to reduce your stress with mindfulness, how to be real, not perfect with Kathy Adams, how to stop losing it with your child, how to be more patient with your kids, how to handle misbehavior. So many powerful things. So make sure you check it out at raisinggoodhumansbook.com 
and sign up to get all the info on the live events. And now join me at the table as I talk to Nefertiti Austin. Nefertiti, thanks so much for coming on the Mindful Mama podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm so I'm so glad you're here. I'm so looking forward to so reading your book, Motherhood So White, which uh, I haven't had the chance to read yet, but I'm so excited to get it. And you you write about being a single black adoptive mother and how how that's really from the, how that's really different from from what is kind of the normative out there so can you just lead us into telling me you know what what made you want to start to write a book about about this okay my background just briefly is i was raised by grandparents and so in the neighborhood i grew up in all of my friends lived with their parents. Everyone had the same last name. So I already kind of felt a little different. Mm -hmm. And though I had a relationship with my parents, my primary household was comprised of my grandparents, my brother and I. And so when I became an adult, I don't think it dawned on me until I began writing my memoir that in some respects, I felt adopted. I just didn't have language for that as a kid. Mm. And my best friend in the whole wide world, we've been friends since we were five, was adopted. And then she became an adoption social worker. So I think adoption always had been in the background for me. And on some level, I knew I wanted to adopt because I saw where it was a good thing. I saw that especially as I got older and I met more people who were adopted and I thought, okay, well, they turned out to be well-adjusted people. And given that I was raised by grandparents, I felt like this would be sort of my way of of giving back kind of a a thank you. And Mm -hmm. so I get ready. I'm I'm having these thoughts, but I I wasn't that deep into what all of these things meant until (laughs) I started actually writing the memoir. But when I was ready to become a mother, I wanted to adopt. That was super important to me. I wanted to be married and I wanted a family, I guess, in the traditional sense. But I really wanted to adopt and I wanted to adopt a black boy because I knew that black boys were less likely to be adopted than girls. Mm -hmm. And so I have I'm I'm ready. I sign up for classes. And because it's one of my favorite things to do is just gather information. I go looking for articles and books and just anything to see how someone who looks like me had navigated this prospect, this venture before. And I right away discovered that, wow, I know I'm not the only black woman who wants to adopt because I knew other women who had adopted. I knew I wasn't the only single person who had adopted, of course, but I couldn't find any narrative that spoke to the journey I was about to embark upon. So that's what got me started writing about it. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess that, you know, when we think about, when we think about adoption, kind of the, the idea that we, we have in our heads is, I mean, at least for me, when I think about adoption, I think the idea that we haven't in my, in my head, I think of like, I guess the, the stereotype in my mind is like a white Christian family, like in the Midwest with a lot of kids. With a lot of children. Yes. Well, that's what's presented that, that image or a white family, a white couple, either cisgender or LGBTQIA, I believe, um, with children of color. But you don't see a black parent with a black children, even though there are black people who adopt. Now, if it's a celebrity, Viola Davis, Shonda Rhimes, Robin Givens, Josephine Baker, although she adopted Rainbow of Children, then you'll see some of that every now and then. But just for a regular, like you said, the stereotype, it is a white family that is adopting for whatever reason, but that becomes sort of like, Oh, these are the people who adopt and that's it. 
Yeah. Yeah. So you, you were looking for those stories and looking for what does it look like for people like you and then just not finding that. And then, so you go create that yourself. That's kind of how this, uh, how this whole, this podcast came about itself actually. Um, And did you, did you, um, did you encounter, um, did you encounter like any hurdles that coming, you know, going into this as either a black woman or as a, you know, a solo parent? Uh, hurdles with regard to adoption or writing. Yeah. Yeah. With the adoption process. No, I live in California, so we're pretty liberal when it comes to that. (laughs) So there were no, no issues there. Welcome. Please come. We've got, you know, 30 plus thousand children in Los Angeles County alone who need families, um, single. So that's, what's great. So, you know, come, come one, come all. So no, definitely no issues, but I will say that going to the very first training class, I was a little, not hesitant, but maybe a little nervous, like, wow, will I be the only single prospective parent there? So that, I wasn't sure, like, who else would be there? You know, would I be the Lone Ranger and are all these couples and it's just me? And that was not the case when I arrived. Uh, so that was great uh, to see, of course, what I knew intuitively that I, you know, obviously couldn't be the only one. So that process actually went pretty smooth. The hurdles, and I, I wouldn't necessarily call them hurdles, but in my own family, sort of the pause, and I didn't even tell mm-hmm. them what I was up to until much later was, well, you're not married and you don't own a house and mm-hmm. you don't have $10,000 saved in the bank. And, you know, no one's going to let you have a baby and that's not a good idea. And so, because of course, I was raised by conservative grandparents who had been married forever. And even though my parents had divorced, in their minds, sort of the proper way to form a family would be to have two parents. And so, there was the concern, which is what how it was explained to me later, <laughs> it was the fear that it was going to be too much. And amongst my friends, they were definitely supportive, but there were people who, you know, sort of politely or offhandedly would say, well, you know, that's, that's, that's going to be a lot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maybe the people already had children. <laughs> they were like, yes, because they knew. <laughs> you sure. You sure that's what you wanted to do. And as a single parent of two children, I definitely, uh, it's hard being a single parent. So that part of it was true. Absolutely true. But, you know, it was what I wanted to do. It was important for me to do it. I certainly wouldn't change anything at all, but, but it's a rough road. It's, it's a lot. Yeah. I mean, imagine there's a lot of fears that come up because, you know, I mean, I'm trying, I'm just kind of thinking back to my own experience that, you know, when I, when I wanted to have kids, I got this like intense biological urge, like have sitting near a friend who was very pregnant. <laughs> so it was like, all of a sudden I was like, I am so ready. Oh my gosh. But you right. know, there's like, for me, you know, there's like nine months to kind of, yes. okay, I'm dealing with this reality. And, you know, as you know, and the, of course, there's fears that you go through, but there's there's no stopping it, right? There's no, no, no. <laughs> like there's no there's no way to kind of stop that train. And when you're in the adoption process, I imagine it must be really different because of the suddenness of having a family, and, and then also like um, the ability to like as you're kind of in the process of making those decisions to be able to back out. You know, right. I, I bet that. Um, that I imagine it takes like a, it makes for some intense kind of personal growth to kind of go through the whole thing. I think so that you, they're definitely, and we are encouraged in the training classes. Look, if you don't want to do it, if you've searched your heart or you've discussed it with your significant other or your support system, and you're really feeling like, wow, this is a great idea, but I don't think I'm going to be able to do it or I'm not really sure that this is the right time, then by all means, don't do it. And I I like that a lot because it's easy to get caught up in having a mommy Jones. I, I, if I had gotten pregnant, that would have been fine. That wasn't necessarily something that I had to have, but every stroller 
baby clothing, all of that. I was all over it. And so I know, <laughs> I understand that feeling where it was just like out of nowhere. I was like, oh my God, oh my God, did you see that stroller? Oh, wow, that is so cool. Look at those bottles. Wow, is that a baby bullet? I mean, those things that I hadn't paid any attention to were suddenly very important to me. So even with the social worker saying, hey guys, if this isn't the right time and you're not ready, I didn't hear any of that because I was ready. And I was very focused, but you are absolutely right. Once my son came, that's where, (laughs) that's when the real work began. So when I go and I speak to these training classes for prospective foster or adoptive parents, I always tell them, this is nothing. When your baby comes to your house, that is when the real work begins. And how old was he when he came? Six and a half months. Oh, wow. I met him when he was six months old. He's 12 now. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I thought, oh, this is my child, this this one right here. And two weeks later, he was, he he moved in. It's like, okay, we are a family. Wow. It was good. It was fun. It was scary. It was good, though. (laughs) Wow. Wow. Um, yeah. So, you know, what, what are some of the, I mean, so I imagine for, you know, you know, there's so, there's so much happening there for you guys, you know, you're, you're jumping into motherhood and all that, but you're also, you know, you chose to have a, a, a baby, a black boy and you, you talk about, and I, and I think this is really something interesting for me and, and especially other like white women and and mothers to think about the burden of um having to like you have to teach him about racism and these intense dangers that can arise for him and i think think about this because you know one of my um greatest inspirations that i love is the book simplicity parenting by kim payne he's been on the podcast okay incredible inspiration i love it it's just about simplifying and one of the messages in that is to simplify media and to kind of filter out the adult world for children, kind of giving them this sort of protective bubble of childhood where they don't really need to, you know, if, as long as they don't need to know all of those, they don't need to know all those dangers out there. It's okay for them to have this safe protected space. But, but as a mom of a, of a black son, you don't have that. Privilege. Yeah, that's that's not even an option um, of, of black girls too. The the boys, and it's funny because like intellectually I knew that, but it didn't really hit me until after I had become a mom. And actually, when my son was five, and I and Trayvon Martin had been murdered, and there was a Black Lives rally not too far from where we lived, and. I'm getting him dressed so we can go. And he had like a little black baby gap hoodie. And we're, and I'm telling him to pull his hood up because it was cold that night. And it was in the act of pulling his, his hoodie up. And so I'm a mother, it's cold. So my job is to keep my child warm. And in that very act, I was like, oh my God, in 10 years, he's going to be a giant. And he will be seen as a threat. And actually, it's sooner than that. But in that moment, that was my thinking that I've got an additional assignment. And so in addition to the basics, like the woman wrote in her book, you know, kind of filtering the world out and letting my child be a child, because those years are very fleeting. So in addition to giving him that gift, I also have to give him the gift of racial discernment so that he can be comfortable out in the world and be aware that when he is out in the world, he will be perceived as threat, even though he is so far from that. But that is the stereotype of Black boys. And it's a heavy burden. It, it's, it's hard on us because it's painful and it's hurtful to have to tell your five-year-old that when you are at school or at the park or in the grocery store, that there are people who will look at you and make negative assumptions about you. They will assume that you're going to steal or they will assume that you're going to hurt their child or they will assume that you 
are not that smart just because of the color of your skin. It's, it's a terrible thing that parents of black children have to have to experience. Wow. I, I can't even imagine uh, having to, having to say that. And then the, 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 pr- the pressure that that puts on that child. And then, and I'm wondering also like for yourself too, like the, um, how do you, how do you talk to him about um, dealing with these people? Because we we know that like that internalized racism is in all of us, right? Like oh, sure. we know that it's in just it's in all the the people of every color in sure. this country who just kind of grow up in this soup. So how do you how do you talk to him, and, and how do you talk think about it yourself as far as like you know um, dealing with and understanding that at that level? Well. Let's see. I think I sort of, I try to be strategic about it. So if there's something that comes up in the news, he may not need to have all of the gory details, but I may share. um, Okay. So when Tamir Rice was killed, um, I can't remember which year that was, but in any event, a boy playing with the toy gun in the park. So, we had been invited to a birthday party and the one of the games that the mom had for the kids to play uh, was like Nerf guns and, and we have them. So I'm not going to play like we don't have them. We, we have them, but she was going to let them play out front. And I said, no. And I had already explained to my son before we went to the party, you may not play with a gun in the front yard. And he wanted to know why. And I explained to him that sometimes there are people on the street and even police officers, because there are some nice, kind officers, and then there's some who are not. But I don't want anyone to mistake that bright yellow gun as a threat and shoot first first and ask questions later. And unfortunately, your friend can play in the front with the gun. You may not. And so I had to tell him that so that there would be no meltdown at the party. Mm -hmm. And so I told the mom that as well. And, and then it was like, Oh my God, I never even thought of that. Well, of course that isn't something you have to think about. That isn't something you have to worry about, but it's something that I have to think about. So I'm not looking for microaggressions and racism around every corner. It's nothing like that. It's, it's typically situational. And as he gets older and he's able to watch programming that like civil rights um, type things. And even when they see us, I did, he hasn't seen that, but he did watch um, See You Yesterday. And so uh, my friends and I, we gathered our black boys together and we sat them down and we had an adult with them and watched it. And then we discussed it later. So sometimes it's spontaneous and then other times we're very intentional about the information that they get. Mm-hmm. And what were those, what you said, when they see us? And what was the other one? Oh, he hasn't seen that one. Oh. Uh, but the other one is called See You Yesterday. And it's a fictional story, but it's about a girl and her friend who are trying to come up with an invention to participate in the science fair. And it's to time travel. And in the midst of her and her buddy trying to come up with this machine, her brother is killed by the police. He and his friend are walking down the street. A robbery happened elsewhere. They get stopped, told to lie face down on the ground, which is incredibly common for a black boy. That's automatic. You sit on the curb or you're told to stretch out face down. And her brother reached for his phone. And the officer is telling him, don't move, don't move. But he reaches for his phone. And the officer, of course, didn't know what he was reaching for and shoots this young man and he dies. And so this, so the, the sister is now, of course, in a fever to get her time machine working because she's trying to go back to save her brother. Oh. Yeah, it was, it was very sad. It was a great <laughs> movie. It came on earlier this year on Netflix, but it was, you know, I was kind of in and out of the room because I've got a younger child. My friend has a younger child. So we had the, the little ones were outside on the trampoline, but the older boys sat and watched and in the scene, where the officer is saying, don't move, don't move. We were gratified that our boys are yelling at the television, don't move, don't move, don't move. So they 
got the message. They understood that don't move means don't move, but you know, they're watching television. They're not in that situation. And now that we've got kids who want to explore the neighborhood on their bikes and on their scooters because, you know, they're preteens, um, I have to give the, if you are stopped by the sheriff, you say what? Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Even if it's not fair, your job is to come home and then you let me handle any situation. You let me handle that later. Mm. I can't even imagine, um, you know, that the, the sense of, you know, there's parents deal with so much anxiety about our kids in yes. general. Right. Sure. And, but the layer of this anxiety of the, of a very real fear yes. that, that your son could be hurt by the people meant to protect him. Yes. That I, how, um, What do you do to help yourself deal with that? Um, Well, I'm fortunate. I have a very tight-knit group of friends. And so, again, it's not stuff we talk about every day because Mm -hmm. this is our reality. So, unfortunately, we are used to it, even though we all live in very stable middle upper upper middle class neighborhood so theoretically these things should not be visited upon our sons and yet we understand that anything is possible and so we definitely engage each other around things that come up and because my background as an adjunct history instructor, I love history and I have a, a master's in African American studies. So in my house, we are always talking about race and we're talking about economics and politics and having an appreciation and an understanding from, okay, you came from this, from people who were stolen from a continent and brought to another country to work on behalf of others, but we are still here. And that's something to be proud of. And so in my house, it comes up more often than Mm -hmm. some of my friends, but that's the nature of living with an academic. So (laughs) that's how that goes. (laughs) So I think how I deal with it is I try not to spend a lot of time on it. I just pray that I have the right words and that my son is at an age where he can hear me and that we can keep talking about it. Mm -hmm. And as a girl, I was never harassed by the police, not as a teenager, college student, none of those things. So I don't even know what that feels like directly. And so Mm -hmm. I'm grateful that I, I know enough men who can say, oh yeah, I was in college and this happened to me. I was in graduate school and this happened to me. I was on my job or on my way to work and we could talk about it. So we kind of share the burden so that it doesn't really just fall on one person. Yeah, that's beautiful. I mean, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, actually last night I went to pick up my nine-year-old daughter from uh, an event and she had had been went back to school recently and she so she asked me in the car she said you know mommy what is a lockdown why do we do a lockdown what what okay. do we, you know why do we do this yeah, that's and i was awful. like oh god you know yeah. <laughs> and it's like and it's interesting to to try to explain these things and i and i said that you know that it's to keep you uh, sometimes there are I said that sometimes there's bad people who may want to come into a school to hurt people. And so this is just to keep you safe. So, so bad people can't see you or find you. And, and that was enough for her for in that, in that moment. Sure. But you know, it's interesting because like there are these moments, right? These touch point moments that, you know, you, you live your, your daily life and all yeah. of that, you know, I can relate to what you're saying and that like you, you live your daily life and all that stuff. And then there's some touch point moments where you're like, Oh my God, this could be my child yeah. in a second, in a flash. Yes. Right. And, flash, but yes. you have to, you have to live your life. But, but then I guess, you, you know, in some ways you balance that with like taking, taking some action. Like I took my daughters to an anti-gun rally 
and you you know and you took your son to the Black Lives Matter rally. So well, was, so there. Tried by the time we got there, it was over. <laughs> but I tried. <laughs> Trying to get a five-year-old out of the house, oy vey. <laughs> yes, yes, I tried. I tried my best, right? Yes, absolutely, yeah. Well, I, it's awful. I mean, with the school shootings and, you know, that's another thing. We don't – I read the news a lot, and when I was my son's age, I was a news junkie. He's slowly getting there, but some of his friends watch a lot of th- – their. Their programming isn't monitored the way his is. And so he will come home and he will ask about like those tragedies and things. And it's scary, you know, for all of the children. And it's like, wow, this is one more, one more thing to have to teach the kids about. And it's like, you know, we don't want to scare the kids or make them feel like they can't leave the house, but we have to let them know like, okay, this is the world in which we live in. Hopefully it'll change. Mm. So are you seeing him start to, you know, as like a 12 year old boy, you know, he's living with you, mom. And, uh, are you seeing, but he, you know, we live in this world where this, it's a world of now, hopefully maybe that's changing of this hyper masculinity and the, and the challenges of that. uh, And then I, I, are you seeing him start to kind of question any of these, these sort of male archetypes or, or bring them on or try them out or anything. I mean, you know, to what you feel comfortable yeah. answering that. I don't want sure. you to betray his trust or anything like that, For but sure. just curious sure. about that. He's at the beginning, I think of trying things on. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's typical kids tease each other, that sort of thing. And they, you know, the, that's just what kids do. It's a rite of passage. So just recently, his feelings have gotten a little hurt by some of the things his friends have said. And so we've discussed it and I explained to him, okay, this is the second year of middle school. High school will be worse. And you will either figure out a way to participate or you will laugh along. And he's like, well, that's dumb. Why would I laugh at myself? And so I, I was like, well, Kevin Hart has made millions of dollars making short jokes you know, he took the power away. I mean, people do it all the time. Um, or you will go find another set of friends. And of course, um, he has figured out how to re-engage. And so it's funny to watch because I cringe sometimes on some of the things he's upset about. But I understand that, okay, this is what boys do and girls do it too. And I explained to him, girls are worse because girls hold grudges. <laughs> At least you guys are friends five seconds later. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm watching that and I think he's slowly, slowly starting to pay a little bit more attention to his appearance. So I'll probably have a better answer in another couple of years, but I, I'm seeing it slowly, slowly, slowly. Like, hmm, oh, you got your hair combed. Nice. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. I like the new hair. Look, yeah, looking you, good. You, you put lotion on. Oh, very good. Okay, we're making some progress. So, so you've been at the solo parenting now for for 12 years. Yes. Um what what has helped you deal with the overwhelming moments? And maybe what advice do you have out there for other overwhelmed parents? Laughter. Uh, So my sweet spots are low budget television. So anything that I don't have to think about, or I could just sit and watch, uh, like one of my favorite shows is Claws. They are so ridiculous. And I eat it up. So that I exercise, that's helpful. That, That definitely makes a big difference. And my friends and I have a very safe space to be very honest about how we feel. I think honesty is the most important thing. And women, moms really need girlfriends that they can be honest with and be able to say, you know what, I'm worn out. This is hard. Or today my child got on my nerves and I don't like him mm-hmm. or I don't like her and, and not be judged for it. So you can say those things and you know that they totally get you and we go on to something else. And being able to sit and have a glass of wine or 
at least fantasize about going on a girl's trip with no children. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, and my yeah. kids are, my, I mean, he's 12. He's, he's pretty manageable. He's an easy kid. And my daughter, sometimes they play together really well. And then I will steal moments away <laughs> from myself. And then other times it doesn't go so well. So uh, I just take it one day at a time. But I would say my best advice would be if you don't have friends that you can be honest with, find some friends that you can be just authentic with about how you feel, highs and lows, and make sure you have something that's just yours, whether it's exercise, in my case, it's writing. I love to read. I don't get to read as often as I would like. I have a friend who takes herself to the movies mm-hmm. once. I think she goes to the movies once a week by herself. And Once a week? I think she goes once a week. And I was like, wow, you can go once a week? Wow, that's a lot. But what she said to me a couple of years ago, she's like, you have got to do something that's just yours, that you do all by yourself. Whatever it is, even if you go engage with other people, but you know, mm-hmm. her husband doesn't go, her boys don't go. That's just for her. Yeah, yeah. And there's too much of this uh, pressure on moms that sort of self sacrificing yeah, meme and ideal. It's it's a mess. It, it creates yeah. so many problems. I really, you know, I really, I have a, a I have a friend who's whose mom is, um, you know, older, she's my mom's age, maybe in her 70s or something, but who grew up with that and never had the things that something that was just hers and never had, you know, the intense support and is now intensely, intensely struggling because, you know, because it can't just all be on that child and or that grandchild, right? That's too much pressure on them. Way too much. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, No, I, I definitely agree. Uh, with that, that you have to find something for yourself, whatever it is. I mean, you know, I have another friend who goes, she's got a very stressful job and she's in charge of a whole bunch of people. And one of the things she likes to do is go to the flower mart, just pick flowers. Mm, I like that. Yeah, Um, that's cool. So one thing I found out about you, Nefertiti, which I think is so cool, is that your work starts seem to help really like spur on or even create the black romance genre in the 90s. Yeah. So, so which is so cool yeah. because why not? I love that. And um and I was just wondering like that you know that's the, that's a part of us that can often get dropped and pushed aside and undervalued when when we're parents and I was wondering how as a solo parent ha- have have you been able to kind of honor that sexual side of yourself that, you know, was it just through your writing? Were you able to, you know, develop relationships? Well, I um, have dated on and off for the last 12 years. And I think the first couple of years as a parent, I, it was, I, I wasn't really interested in dating or anything. I was very much focused on building a life and a community for my son. And once I kind of felt like, okay, he's good. He squared away. I got out a little bit more. I would I would go out more and I did a little dating. And then my second child came and so she was unexpected. <laughs> so I was like, okay. So then I was in the throes of juggling two kids six years apart by myself. And that was crazy making for a bunch of years. And so... I think in the last year or so, I have definitely, I've got more time, a little more time. And because she's older, it's easier to get folks to babysit like two kids instead of just one. Oh, yeah. And That's- so I did go on a nice trip out of the country last year with a friend. So that was lovely. Oh, good. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So that was that was fun, and he was great. He did everything. I was like, "Oh my God, I'm normally the one who does everything for everybody." So that was wonderful to let someone else do all the thinking for us, and he did all the driving, and he paid for everything. It was fantastic, and um, so he and I have remained friends, and so I'm I'm open to um, yeah, 
I'm open to all of that, whatever that would look like. So, oh, sure. all right, all right. So, keeping those coals burning, you know, <laughs> absolutely. Well, you know, I, I, I love my children. However, they are going to grow up and leave me, and I don't see. I never thought I'd be a single parent, anyway. Um, but. I don't want to grow old by myself. I mean, I have my friends and they're great, but that it, it will be great. I look forward to having someone in the home just to share all of the experience with. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like in a lovely way, at least on that vacation, you were, you know, it's like that sense of that we need, right? As women, right? Of being valued and, yes. and respected and appreciated and all of those things. And, uh, and I was thinking about that, like, and you know, we live in this like, you know, predominantly white patriarchal society, right? Where women are undervalued, but then black women especially are, are, you know, undervalued even more so. And, and I was wondering like, you know, what are your thoughts on how do we begin to raise the value of women, of mothers in our society, but even especially black women? Mm -hmm. Well, there's definitely a racial hierarchy where black women find ourselves at at the bottom. Well, one thing, and this was, this goes back to writing my memoir, writing essays about race and gender, and really focusing on motherhood later, is that if the definition of mother is white, then it makes it difficult for anyone else to have a seat at the table. And so we all have something that we can contribute. And given the history of black women, black mothers, and white children in this country, you would think that that would be a no-brainer because we've got a lot of experience having been wet nurses and mammies and nannies to white children when we couldn't even take care of our own kids. And so I think it's acknowledging the historical contribution of black mothers. And also, I think that white mothers need to reach across the aisle, make some black mom friends, so that we can begin to forge relationships. And it will help break down the stereotype. So as a single black mother out in the world, I I hadn't thought too much of how I was perceived until I got it. I was like, oh, so you can't look at me and tell my education or where I've been or where I live or any of those things, but you can look at me and see I got two kids, no ring, so I'm either divorced or there's no man in the picture anywhere, and I'm bringing the curve down because there goes another woman on welfare, draining the system with her kids with no daddy. And so I think we have to, uh, this is where honesty comes in, break down these stereotypes about what moms of color look like. I mean, I think the most universal feeling in the world is the love of a child. Mm -hmm. And so that's a, that's a, a common space that we all share. And there's so much policy that needs attention and input from all of us. Um, paternity leave, maternity leave, um, early childhood education, maternal health, black maternal health. So many conversations that we need to be part of. That's definitely one way to raise, I guess, our profile um, publishers not telling black mom writers, oh yeah, your experience is important, but it's marginal and we can't sell it. So we're not going to, you know, an agent saying, you know, I won't represent you because your experience is marginal. That kind of stuff is like, really? Mm. You know, so Mm -hmm. um, I think it's making a conscious effort to acknowledge that we are all moms and while culturally there are nuances and experiences that we have that other groups may not have. There are some core things that we do share that we need to work on. And so like in a school, in a, in a diverse educational environment, it's more than just the kids playing together at school. It's inviting p- 
people over and, and white people accepting the invitation, come to my neighborhood. Come to my child's game. You know, we're not always just going to go your direction. Mm -hmm. Being able to reciprocate those invitations help the ch so the kids have built their relationship, and I think the parents really assisting the growth of those relationships. Because if the kids see their parents interacting with other people, they will think, "Oh yeah, this is the norm. I have friends from all walks of life, and I have friends of every color." As opposed to, "Oh, these are my school friends." but we only socialize with this particular group over here. Yeah. Yeah. I think all the, you know, that's what we need, right? We need to acknowledge contributions historically. We need to reach across the aisle. And, and, you know, as you're saying these things, like I'm, I'm thinking about my own life and it's really interesting because, you know, um, like my, my sister-in-law is, um, is from Senegal. So, okay. you know, my nieces are, are, and my, you know, we have a very racially diverse family right there, you know, with my kids, cousins and things like that. But where I live mm -hmm. in Wilmington, Delaware, it's like an amazingly segregated place sure. where, you know, there's a, so many black families like in the city and then the suburbs are like very white. Okay. And it's, I, I feel frustrated with it. Like, actually, I was part of, um, I was part of a, I'm, I'm very passionate about Montessori school and I was part of a, oh, yes. a founding, I was a founding board member to bring this first public charter Montessori into the state. And our school is d downtown in the city and it's a much more diverse school than their, when, when they first started going to Montessori it was a private school. Sure. And so I feel really good about that, but I still feel like it feels like, especially in my area, there are these divides. And I guess especially for a person who works from home, right? Like, mm -hmm. I feel like there's there are these divides between the, the you know, the, the white people tend to hang out with the white people and black sure. people tend to hang out with the black people. And, 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 and it's, it's hard to, it's hard to bridge that divide. But, but as you're speaking, I'm thinking, well, maybe I, I just need to make an effort to do it a little bit more. I don't know. It's, yeah. it's a tough, it's a tough question. We all have so much history and, and yeah. baggage with all that, that we all bring to this table. Well, definitely. Well, I mean, yes, I, I think that especially if you are aware of it, you could have a gathering, you know, after the soccer game or, or at school or what have you, where you invite and it, and it does take effort to, re, to go over and say, hey, we're having this and we would love for you to come and join us. And I think that definitely for Black people, we feel that we are always the ones educating everyone. Mm -hmm. We're always the ones who are having to make nice, who are having to not come across as being um, maybe too focused on race or too this or too that to make white people feel comfortable. And mm. so that in itself, in, in itself is exhausting. And a big part of the reason why black people stay with black people, because it's like, okay, yeah, I'm going to, yeah, this is going to require too much work. And also not always knowing if our efforts will be received the way we want them to be. And so, but someone's got to do it. I mean, that's just, mm effect. And, um, and the other thing that your kids can do, um, that white moms can teach their kids is to take care of their black kid, their black friends, their Latinx friends, take care of your friends. And if you can get away with taking a shortcut through your neighbor's backyard, because the neighbor knows you on the day my child is walking home or, or over for a play date, don't do that. And if your friend is making an ugly comment and, you know, my child is with you, then your, your friend should stand up and say, you know what, that's not cool. Yeah. Don't say those things. So there, there are things that we can teach our children and get them thinking about. We have to take care of each other. Mm, I like that. I like that, that we can teach our kids to take care of their black friends. Yeah. I mean, I think about that 
you know, I think about it's funny because and I was and I want to just ask you, Nefertiti, what you, mm-hmm. you sort of think about this, because I think about this often because I'm with my nieces and mm-hmm. we'll be with my mom and my nieces up in Rhode Island. We'll be at the beach and those two girls will be the only black kids yep. on mm-hmm. that whole beach. And I just yep. feel for them. And I don't know if they notice that. And I don't know sure. if it's my place to talk. You know what I mean? I, just, I don't know where I fit in that. Right. But and so, you know, that's an, an issue that comes up. And and for so many, I think, white parents, probably especially like like I imagine a lot of people feel like me, like they feel we feel guilt, right? That that Mm -hmm. pervasive, like white guilt of like, yeah, "Yeah, we've benefited from these structures that are just Mm -hmm. so deeply inhumane and unfair. And the history of our country is so heartbreaking, you know? Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. and, but at the same time, I would probably say, you know, maybe that wiser part of me would say to myself, you know, that, um, you know, to, to offer myself some, Com- some compassion and forgiveness because this is not something I had control over yet. Maybe this is something I can, can take action towards. So I'm just wondering if like you would say, you know, what you would say to that as far as like maybe advice for other people like me who feel that guilt. And then, you know, I think the, you know, it, it probably helps us to just feel that a little bit, feel that compassion for, are the people of color in our world and but also feel that compassion and and you know and not not be harsh and judgmental on ourselves for maybe what we um have you know what thoughts have arisen in our mind right because of that you know ingrained racism that we all have but to Mm -hmm. to offer ourselves as well as others some of that compassion so that then we can move forward and take an action from there i mean would you say that would be a, a good way to approach this well, I have a couple of thoughts about that. Yeah. So number one, one thing that definitely white parents can do, even if there isn't a child of color for miles around, is there's so much content. There isn't enough, but there's enough content, at least in books or on television programs or movies, that speak to our experience. And you can educate your child on to the best of your ability of, hey, this isn't your experience, but this girl wanted to save her brother, so she's building a time machine Mm -hmm. to do that. Because in her neighborhood, the norm is that the police harass um, young Black youth, and sometimes they end up dead. And so while you may never face that, Directly, you may have a cousin who is biracial or you may grow up and marry someone who is black or something else. And then it becomes your reality. So don't wait for it to become your reality to take action. So I think that that is definitely some, even when kids are little, I mean, hair with, with the kids, you know, they are wanting to touch each other's hair and they're wanting to understand, well, this person's hair is straight or that person's hair is curly. There are a number of books out about kinky curly hair and um, different textures and feelings around hair that will give white children a window into oh, okay, so here's a different experience from mine. It, it's not good, it's not bad, it's just different from mine, and that it's okay that it's different. So I don't think that shying away from it will help because we definitely know that when you put your head in the sand, you know, definitely a problem won't go away. I think that it's going to, again, require effort. So if there is a cultural fair or a museum in your neighborhood, or when you travel, make a point to go to the social justice um, rallies or art exhibits, you know, age appropriately, of course, Um, museums, that sort of thing. So there's so, I think, a lot of opportunities for white parents to educate themselves and their children about other people's experiences, because we, Black people, are taught to know all of your experiences Mm -hmm. and how you guys feel about it. And we don't, you know, so there's no guilt 
there. I mean, it's just our norm. We're expected to know how you guys feel and the things that you want, but that isn't necessarily mirrored back to us. So yeah, that would be my suggestion. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> well, Nefertiti, I was like glancing at the time, even as I sort of la- asked you that last question, I can't believe how fast this time is. <laughs> it's been really, um, it's really been a pleasure to talk to you. I really appreciate you doing the work that you're doing, sharing so honestly and openly and clear, you know, just with the, this, this clarity of sight and heart about your experience and, and sharing it with us so that we can become sharing it with me and, and the listeners so that we can all become, you know, a little bit more open and a little bit more understanding of where people are coming from and just, uh, just helping to, helping to, to, to make this place a little better bit by bit. So thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. I appreciate it. I had fun. Good. Good. Tell people about the book and where they can find it once more. Okay. So my memoir is called Motherhood So White, a memoir of race, gender, and parenting in America. And you can find it wherever books are sold, local indie bookstores, Amazon, Target. It will be everywhere. And um excited. It should be in the memoir nonfiction section of the uh, books. Yeah, that should be yeah. pretty cool. So exciting. I'm so excited for you. Uh, as a now an author, I'm like, oh my God, I feel so excited for everyone else too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, <laughs> you. Thank you so much, Nefertiti. Ah, thank you so much for listening. Wasn't this a powerful conversation? You can tell it was, for me, I I want to be able to, de- you know, to ease the burden that Black parents experience, and I often don't know how to do that. So it was so powerful for me to be able to talk to Nefertiti and to, you know, to get these tips on how to do that. So I am, let's do these things together. It's a way we can be that change that we want to be. Before you go, I re- want to remind you that we are having the Raising Good Humans is available for pre-sale now. My book, ah, I'm so excited. And we're going to be having a live event, Raising Good Humans Live, to launch it. I'm going to be doing interviews with amazing teachers talking about like how to get little kids to listen with Julie King and Joanna Faber, talking to Kathy Adams, how to be real, not perfect, Dr. Laura Markham on how to handle misbehavior, all kinds of amazing teachers. So I hope that you will join us for the Raising Good Humans Live event. And um, you can learn more about it at RaisingGoodHumansBook.com. So thank you so much again for listening. Um, I hope if you haven't already, you subscribe and leave ratings on the podcast and share it. Share it with friends. It's the best, the best way. And I love getting all those like shout outs and things on Instagram. So please do do continue to do that. They, you know, your messages that putting out this podcast and sometimes like doing the work that I do and and making this this a business that supports my family and doing the work that I do to support other moms it can be hard there's like challenges that come up there's there's problems to overcome there's so much learning to do and I have my team to support who helps me make this podcast and when you send me the notes of appreciation they make it all worthwhile. They really do. They remind me of why I'm doing what I'm doing, why this is so important, and that this really is a conversation. Um, So from the bottom of my heart, thank you for those. And uh, know that it reaches me and it really reaches my heart. Um, So I really appreciate you and when you do that. Um, So I hope we'll be able to connect again um, for that Raising Good Humans Live event soon. And otherwise, you know, just hit me up say hello. All right. I am wishing you a beautiful week. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. And I will be back in your ears next week. All right. Namaste.